Amen. It is a great thing to praise King Jesus. He bore that cross for us. Hey, uh, actually, as we just open up and look at the word today, would you actually join me in prayer as we get started? Father, uh, I can never stop thanking you enough just for who you are and how much you love us. God, I, I pray that this evening, as, as we look at what your gospel is, as we look at the good news of Jesus Christ, that, that it would actually sink into all of our hearts, that we would see the truth of what you did sending your own son, Jesus, that we would see the reality of what you went through so that you could actually restore us to right relationship with you. God, I, I pray that you would do a mighty work and a move here this afternoon, this evening, as we look at the beauty of how much you've loved us by dying for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name and his blood poured out for us on that cross. Amen. I had, uh, I'd been walking pretty faithfully with Jesus for about five years when I started to get into like theology. And I mean like deep theology, reading like all these guys that were from like hundreds of years before, looking at like the deep mysteries of Christ that, that are found in this Bible. And, and just standing in awe at this idea of, man, this is how big our God is. Like this is how gracious and amazing. And I'm just like getting into all this theology stuff. And, and it's really impactful me. And at the same time, I've been volunteering at this place called Skate Church, which is an evangelism-focused ministry. It, it's this parachurch organization where, where kids, these skateboarder kids would come in, they skate these ramps, and we, and we tell them about Jesus. Like, hey, this is what you need to know in order to meet Jesus and be saved. And then we'd plug them into churches and see them discipled up. And, but, but what's happening is, as I'm like learning all this theology stuff, I'm like, oh man, this is so good. They gotta know this. And, and oh, this is so good. They gotta know this. And, and so what I end up starting to do is, what, what's supposed to be like a 15-minute message that is focused on the core foundations of the gospel, starts to become 20, 25, 30 minutes of like pure boredom for them, even though it's excitement for me. Hey, and I'm not seeing students like get, get saved and, and meet Jesus, and I'm kind of frustrated. And at, at one point, I just sit down one day and I'm just praying. And I'm, I'm just like, man, God, what is going on? And, and it was like the Holy Spirit just impressed, impressed upon my heart. Like, you didn't get saved on any of that. that that's not what you heard to get saved. And, and that's all I needed to hear in that moment. And I realized, yeah, this stuff is amazing. Man, the deep mysteries of God. I, I want to see these. I want to know these. I want to go deeper into this. But, but this is five years in, and, and this is not what I needed to know to get saved. And this is not what they need to know in this moment. They need to know what it is to meet Jesus and start a relationship with him. And all that stuff can come later. And, and so what I did is I took a piece of paper, <coughs> And I sat down and I just started writing out, man, what, what is the gospel? Like, like, what are the foundational core things that we need to know in the gospel? And there was lines that I was like crossing out, not that they're not important or anything like that, but, but it was just like, no, that's not needed in order to know who this Jesus is and, and to meet him. And so what I endeavored to do is I was like, I'm going to preach a less than five minute gospel message. I remember the day that I did it too. It was actually like three or four minutes long is all it took. And all the students were like, wait, what? That's it? We're done? Like three minutes? Like that, that's it? But what that did for me particularly, it, it was incredible because, because it trained me like this is actually the foundation of it. It equipped me in order to be able to actually tell others this really good news about of, of Jesus Christ through evangelism. Help me find inroads to the gospel because I could point to, you. no, it's not this massive, heady theological thing, but, but it, there's this foundational core at it. But, but the other thing it did is it actually helped because I was able to, when I boiled this down, I was able to preach the gospel to myself and sit and treasure and soak in the gospel of Jesus Christ daily. Because the gospel is not something that we ever move on from. We move deeper into it. And so often we need to, to, to return to what is the core of it? What is the foundation that it's built on? And treasure what Christ has done for us. And, and, and so the, this really just helped me in that. And this is what we're looking at today. And this series of theologies, right? This theology, like what, what are all the doctrines of the Christian faith? Like the, this is the, if you want the big theological word, it's soteriology. But you don't have to learn 
isn't that. It just means the doctrine of salvation. Like how, how is one saved by Jesus Christ? And if you want to boil down, here it is. We were created in the image of God to know him and to reflect his glory. But here's what we've done is we've sinned. We have sinned against a holy and a righteous God and an eternal God. And for that, we actually deserve death and death eternal. But God loves us, and that's not what he wants for us. So he sent Jesus, his only son, to become one of us. Jesus steps into humanity, walks through everything that we do, yet without sin. And he went to his death, which he didn't deserve, so that he could pay the price that we ought to pay. And he rose again that we might have life, and that you can have a restored relationship with him if we would have faith in Jesus unto salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Man, that, that's the foundation of this gospel that, that every real church everywhere preaches. This is the foundational core of it. This is how we get saved. This is the central message of this whole thing. Really, this entire thing is the gospel, right? It's God's redemptive story from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22, the whole thing is the story of God's salvation that he offers for people. But, but the core theme of that message is that. Hey, and if you didn't catch all of it, the, the way that's really helpful for me to remember it is to look at it in four waves, right? Four movements of the gospel. And the first is that creation, right? We were created in the image of God to know him. And the second is fall, that, that humanity has fallen into sin and deserves eternal death. And the third is, is so cool, is redemption, that, that Jesus buys his people back, that, that he pays his blood, the death that we deserved, so that we could actually have eternal life with him. And restoration is we are restored to right relationship with him through faith in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Those are the four movements of the gospel, the, the four things that, that help us see, like, man, this is the foundational core of the gospel. So this is what we're going to get into, it is each of those four things a little bit more in depth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it starts off with creation, right? Genesis, the, the whole Bible, the whole redemptive story starts off with God creating the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And then he sets the sun and the moon and the stars and the sky, and he creates the land and the sea. He creates the plants and the animals and the fish and the birds and all of those things. But the crown of his creation, the very pinnacle, the crown of his creation is on, the day, on day six. The last thing that he creates, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Man, humankind, actually, if you, if you jump down just a couple of verses from that, it says male and female, he created them. Like all humans, all humans are created in the image of God. We bear his likeness. This is a beautiful and amazing thing that we see here. That, and we actually see a few things in this text. That we are created in the image of God, but we are also created to rule. Like God creates us in his image to have dominion over the earth. That, that we, we would bear his likeness. And this likeness is not like some physical form of likeness that no one has ever seen God. But this is what it is. It's the likeness of who he is in his essence. If you ever experience joy or laughter, ever experience anything like, like awesomeness of relationship. We are created in the likeness of the triune God that has had perfect relationship with each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all of eternity. We are created in that likeness. Even the senses of frustration and injustices that we see, our God is a God of justice and that is in us, that, that he created this and we, we bear this image and this likeness of him. Who we are as people is modeled after him because he modeled that in us. And he, he designed us to, to rule and to have dominion over the earth, 
just like he rules and has dominion over all things. And this is, this is it. But the, the third one I think that is implied in those verses is, is that he, is, he created us to reflect his glory. The very fact that we're made in his image, the very fact that we're created to rule over the earth and have dominion, like shows like God is a glorious God. And he created us to reflect his glory that every time that we would see one another, that when we see humans, that when we, we see one another and we see these senses of joy and laughter and justice and all that, that we would get a little glimpse of who God is, a little glimpse of what he is like. We are created to be image reflectors. And, and this whole point of creation is so, so pertinent to this story of the gospel because who we are meant to be has to be understood because when something gets broken, which it obviously is in this world, we look around this world and we see people and we see all the problems and there's obviously something broken. And if you want to fix something that's broken, if you want to see something broken fixed, you have to understand what the problem is. I, I think about it this way. I drive a 1981 Toyota pickup and the, on the side, there's this little door that opens up, and it, it's got this cap that you twist off and a tube that goes down to a tank, right? And, and, and it's designed for fuel. But if in my head, I believe that the purpose of that is for windshield washer fluid, my truck is not going to run right, and I am going to destroy it. I am going to break it. If I try to use its purpose for something completely different, I am going to break it. And if it gets broken doing that, if I don't un, like come back and understand, actually know this is for fuel and I keep trying to put the windshield washer fluid in there, it's going to continue to stay broken and not work. This is why it's so important for us to understand actually what we're created for. Be, because the, the remedy relies on that in us actually understanding what has happened in the fall, which is the next movement of the gospel. The fall into sin. And the fall into sin is actually connected to what we were created for, is that we were created to reflect his glory. And this is why in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our sin, our moral corruption, everything that, that we've messed up and done is actually connected to this idea of glory. God connects it for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God could have just left it at that when he had Paul the apostle write down these words for us. He could have just left it at for all have sinned, for all have broken his law, for all have done this, but he says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is absolutely pertinent because when we fall into sin, we ultimately defame his glory. We have all fallen into sin. There's no one accepted, and when we do that, we defame his glory. We make a mockery of it because what we do at that moment is we reject God's good plan for us, substituting our own. We reject his good plan for our lives. This is the essence of what sin is. Think about it like this. Adam and Eve, the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3. We're, we don't even get three full chapters into the Bible before everything goes sideways, right? We, we, it's the very beginning. We don't, we don't even get three chapters in, and they're, they're given all these commands. Adam and Eve are given these commands of, hey, rule the earth and have dominion. Be fruitful and multiply, and then there's this other command that, that almost seems sort of arbitrary at, at the beginning. Hey, there's this one tree, and it's got fruit on it. Don't eat of that tree. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And you're like, man, that seems sort of arbitrary. Why can't they eat of that tree? Like, like what's the big deal? But, but here's where I, what I think God is doing in this moment with him. Is he knows what's best for them. He knows what's best for us. And he says, hey, will you trust me? Believe me, trust me. I've given you dominion over this, but I have dominion over you and everything else. Trust me. And what they do when they take of that fruit, because it looks good to the eyes, and it would make them wise, is they reject God's good plan. And this is what we do in our sin. Think of the reality of this. God, the God of all the universe, the God so powerful, he spoke everything into existence and formed us out of clay. 
This God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, who has existed for all of eternity, that, that knows us like our intricate being and everything that we need and designed us for a very specific reason. Here's what we do in our sin. Here's what Adam and Eve did, and here's what we do in every single one of our sins. We say, God, I know all of that, and I know that you know what's best, and I know that you're all-powerful, but screw you, I'm God, I'm doing it my way. Man, that's what we do in our sin. And, and when you say it like that, it seems kind of dumb, but, but this is what we go back to every single day. This, this is how we live our lives, saying, no, 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 I get to be the God, the sovereign of my life. And God's like, no, would you trust me? And we have to hit this sin thing because it's so fundamental to the gospel. Because... Without the sin, there's not a need for a savior, right? Right. We, we always, God is love. They're, like the Bible says that God is love and he's gracious and he cares about us. And, and sometimes when we talk about sin, it's like, well, why are we talking about all this if God is so loving and so gracious? No, we actually don't understand how gracious and how loving he is unless we understand the depths of our own depravity. Right, right. This idea of depravity, the state of moral corruptness, and that's actual like a dictionary definition. Depravity, the state of being morally corrupt. Now, I, I would actually personally take it further and say, it's the state of moral corruption due to our rejection of God as God. Man, th this is what happens. We are depraved people. And our depravity and the weight and like depth of our depravity isn't based on comparing ourselves to anybody else. It's about our relationship with God because we have rejected him as God. And we need to actually feel the weight of depravity for a specific reason. And that specific reason is not that we would be burdened in shame. The purpose of our understanding our depravity is not to burden us in shame. It's not to say, oh, woe is me, I'm so terrible, and just feel bad about anything. It's actually supposed to lead us to something. I think about the book of Judges. It's the seventh book in the Bible, um, Israel. God's chosen people had gone into a land that God had prepared for them, and they, they finally get into the land. They'd been wandering in the desert for like 40 years. They're led into the land, and Joshua dies off. And you know what the people do is they reject God and they go back to all their idols and all their false gods and everything. And you know what God does? He actually brings oppression in upon them. He brings other countries in to oppress them. And what they do is when it gets so bad, they cry out, God, would you save us? God brings about this discipline so that they would actually know their need for God. Like, God disciplines those who he loves, Hebrews chapter 12. Like, he brings in this discipline so that they would understand their need for God, and they just go through the cycle over and over and over and over again, where it's like, oh man, like this judge is raised up, they're saved out of all the oppression, and then like things are good for a while, and they get complacent, and they're like, well, screw you, God, I'm doing my thing, and then like God brings it in again. And man, this is just the cycle that we, we so often get into over and over and over again. But... But if we could actually understand our own sin and our own depravity to a way that, that it wouldn't just burden us in shame, but that we would see our tendency towards sin and that it would drive us to our knees and cry out for God. The purpose of understanding our depravity is to know our need for God. This is why we look at sin and we look at the depths of it and, and, and reflect on that point, is that we would say, oh yeah, no, no. I do need God, and God is the only one that can save me. I cannot save myself. Man, the fall sucks. Sin sucks. But, but we have a Jesus who wants to save us. We have a Jesus who came down for the specific purpose of dealing with our sin. And this is where we get to the third movement of the gospel, redemption. Redeem, to, to buy back to pay the penalty that we deserve, that we deserve death and death eternal, and Jesus comes to pay that price. Can you imagine, like, Jesus stepping out of eternity, like, like always in perfect union and perfect harmony with God the Father and God the Spirit, hanging out for all of eternity, and he humbles himself to become a, 
like helpless little baby, he becomes one of us in humanity. He steps into humanity. He steps into the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin himself. And he walks through this life. And he's tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Think about the the implications of that. God is not some just far off God who has no idea what it's like to be one of us and undergo the trials and the difficulties and the pains that we go through. And whatever pains, whatever trials that you've walked through, Jesus fully understands them. He fully understands them because he walked them too. He walked through all of that, yet never sinned. And so what does he do? He goes to that cross. He goes to that cross to pour out his blood, to take care of our sin, to take care of the debt that we owed. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus goes to that. And as he goes to that cross, he knows what he's doing. Just picture him in the Garden of Gethsemane and his his disciples falling asleep when they're supposed to be praying. And he's praying so hard, he knows the heaviness and the weight of what's about to happen, that he's about to take the very wrath of God the Father upon himself for our sins. To so much, so stressed that he's sweating blood before he gets betrayed by his own disciple and his own follower. And the Romans, they take him, the Jews cry out, crucify him, his own chosen people. And the Romans rip the flesh out of his back and they pierce his hands with nails and they put a crown of thorns on his head and he bleeds out. And the whole time, you know what he says when he gets put up on that cross and he's suffocating to death? Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. I mean, think of how precious that blood is that Jesus paid. Jesus paid it all. Every bit that we owed. So precious is his blood. Check out 1 Peter chapter 1. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Jesus pays it all. When he took death on that cross for us, he one time for all people, if they would have faith in him, took the penalty of our sins, the penalty of every sin that you could ever possibly do, all the sins from your past, all the sins from today, and all the sins from your future. If you have faith unto salvation in Jesus Christ, Jesus paid for every last one when his blood was was shed for you. Jesus paid it all. And you know what we pay? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There is no work. There is no amount of anything that we can do that can even contribute to our salvation. Jesus paid it all. We pay nothing. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Man, Jesus pays it all and we pay nothing because what he does here is his point is to actually restore things to the way that they were supposed to be, right? This idea that God would remain God and that we would have faith and reliance on him who knows what's best for us. This is what Jesus is doing, is that it cannot be by the works that we're doing because then we try to become gods ourselves again and we just fall into the same old trap of sin. Jesus pays it all because he's the one that has the power to do it. He's the one that's able to live the perfect life that we could never live, to die the death that we ought to have died. He paid it all so we can pay nothing so that we can be restored in life to him again. And that gift is offered to us. That gift is actually offered to us, but there's an acceptance of that gift. And it's not a work, it's just a pure acceptance of the free gift of God for eternal life. It is this that starts to restore us in our relationship to him. 
I said earlier that it starts off with Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is where salvation happens. We have faith in Jesus. We believe that he died and rose again and that it's his payment that can make us right with him again. And we say, yeah, Jesus, you are Lord. You are master of my life. You are God, and you're restoring this relationship to the way that it should be. Man, so we, we move into this fourth movement of restoration that, that Jesus begins to, to restore. And there, there's actually two big parts, two big movements of this restoration. There's the now part of restoration and the then. And the now part is this restoration of relationship. It's this restoration of relationship because even now we get to be reconnected with the God that we've been separated from. Check out 1 John chapter 1. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Do you see that? There's this fellowship that we get to have together as the church and that we get to have with God because Jesus died, because he paid the penalty that we deserve. He restores us in connection to him, that we get to have a relationship with him, that we get to speak and communicate with him. Part of the restoration of this relationship is communication. Jesus, as he goes to his death, the, the night before he's betrayed, he, he's in this upper room with all of his disciples, and he's giving these last instructions and last teachings. And he says this, In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Man, what Jesus does when he redeems us, when he pays the blood, he actually makes it possible that we get to go to the very throne room of God the Father and ask whatever we want. That we get to go talk to our God. That he restores that relationship that we can go talk to him and we don't need an intercessor anymore. That Jesus intercedes for us one time for all of eternity. And then we get access to the throne room of God and we get access as children of the Father adopted heirs into his family that the king would say, yeah, come into the throne room and talk to me. I want to hear from you. Ask me things. I want to answer them. And we get communication, this restoration of relationship and communication. We get to talk to God. Man, how cool is that? Anytime you want, day or night, whatever's going on, we get to talk to God the Father and he listens to us. We can ask him for anything. Now, there's things that he says no to because he's wiser than us. But we get to talk to him about anything, whatever we're going through. There's this restoration of relationship and communication. But, but he also starts to restore who we are. It's this theological term called sanctification, which basically just means being restored to be more like Jesus. Right? This is what we are created for in the first place, is to bear his image. And, and this process of sanctification that we walk through is to be more, made more and more like Jesus. Second Corinthians puts it this way, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Man, there's this transformation that happens in our lives. This transformation to be made more like Jesus. And this is what we get to walk through, this, this restored relationship. And it's all made possible by what Jesus did on that cross. But there's another greater thing that we get to look forward to. There, there's a second movement of restoration that happens then. That happens as we step into eternity, and it's the restoration of all things, and I mean all things. The restoration of everything that Jesus one day is going to restore absolutely everything. 
That, that even our world right now is so broken because of our sin that God subjected creation itself to futility. God subjected creation itself to futility in hope. And he's even going to restore the creation. And he's going to make it complete and whole and perfect. There's this restoration of all things, that, that there's creation restored, that there's perfection. Pain is done away with. But, but ultimately, there's presence, the very presence of God. We are restored in relationship right now. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your relationship is restored with him, and we get to be in the presence of God now. We, we get to experience his presence, but, but not fully, not like we will that day, not like we will when we step into eternity and see him face to face. That presence is going to be so much better. Check out all three of these things that you see in this verse, these, this passage in Revelations 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe every away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Man, do you see what it's going to be like? A new creation, a new world that is not subjected to futility. There's no more pain. There's no more crying. There's no more of any of that. And we get to be with God. He will be our God and we will be his people and we get to dwell with him. If I saw God in all his glory with an unglorified body, I'd get smoked. But we get new glorified bodies that can handle being in his presence. That we get to be with the living God. Man, this is why the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 1, he says to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Man, he looks forward to that day and he says it is to die is gain. He goes on to say, I desire to depart. His heart's desire is that he would be able to dis depart this world. He's like, man, I want to die. And not this depressed type of thing, but a hope for the future. A hope that he looks at. And he, he has a taste of that joy. And that joy is going to be so much more magnified in that day that he just longs to be in his presence. Do you long to be in the presence of God? This is what we have open to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He created us to be with him. And we rejected him. And he went so far to go to his own death that Jesus, the son of God, would go to his own death to buy us back so that we could be with him, and it's going to be the best thing ever. It's going to be the absolute best thing ever, and I, I, I always falter at words to try and describe this. Like, like the best thing ever, those words are lame and they're weak, but I, I don't even know what to say. Have you ever experienced the joy of the Lord, had even just a taste of it? Have you had a taste of it in the mornings when you open up your Bible and you see the grace and the goodness there as he talks to you? Have you experienced the joy of the Lord that even in the trials and troubles and the things that you're going through that you pray and you know that the Holy Spirit is there abiding with you? Have you ever tasted of that? Even just the smallest taste is the greatest joy that we could ever possibly know. Oh, how good it's going to be when we are in his presence. I mean, think about those times. If you're a believer in this room and... And you gather with the church. People are standing. We are all of one accord. Singing praises to the King Jesus. And the joy that comes. Man, think what it's going to be like. When his glory is just shining. And all the people and all 
the world that have ever existed, that have had faith in Jesus unto salvation are standing there. People from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue, and with one accord, just millions of them, all with one voice raise a shout and say, Jesus, you are king. And they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Man, that day is going to be so awesome. That joy is going to be so awesome. And every time I just get the slightest taste of it, it just sets me on fire. Man, that joy is like nothing else. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the joy that you are missing out on. Man, this joy, there is a joy with Jesus that nothing compares to. And the gospel is the center of it all. The, his redemptive story, his story from beginning to end is to say, man, I created you for something. I created for you to actually experience this relationship and this joy with me. And every time you rejected me, I still had a plan to save you and restore you. And we have the truth of the gospel. So as we close here, I want to just speak to two groups of people. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, man, can I just push you to go deep into the gospel? We never move on from the gospel. We only move deeper into it. Learn to articulate it, to know it. It will have a massive impact on your life. Preach it to yourself every day. Go back and look at the lengths that Jesus went to save you so that you could be restored in relationship to him. Anything this world has to offer is nothing compared to even just the slightest amount of joy with him. Push into the gospel, believer. And if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, can I just tell you, you're missing out. You're missing out. You're missing out on the greatest thing that has ever been and ever will be. And can I just invite you in? Jesus invites you in. The gospel is before you. Jesus paid it all. You pay nothing. He offers you the gift. Will you take it? Taking that gift is just simply an act of faith. Jesus, I believe you died and you rose again for me save me. Can I just encourage you to take that step and enter in to the greatest joy you will ever experience? Let's pray. Father, you're so good. You have been preparing a place and a home for us for thousands of years, a new creation. Not only that, because of what Jesus did, we get to walk with you now. We get to worship you now. That we get to stand with the church now, crying out, holy. Because you are holy, set apart, above everything. God, I pray this evening that you would press every believer in this place deeper into your gospel, that we would dwell on it this week, that we would go deeper into it this week, that you would change our hearts to stop focusing on the things of the world and we would focus on you, that we would be bold as we ought at our workplaces and our schools and everywhere that we're at with the gospel because people need to hear it. God, and I pray for anybody that doesn't know you in this room, God, would you awaken them to the joy that they can have in Jesus. Would you let them see how big and how amazing that joy is? Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. God, we praise you for you are holy. We thank you for your gospel. Pray this in Jesus' name and his blood poured out for us on that cross. Amen.